everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I've got a wonderful special guest who's been a friend for quite a while in these fields of functional integrative medicine. We both teach at A4M, uh, Dr. Jim Valle, right? Valle? <laughs> Lavelle. Laval. Laval. <laughs> My brain today. Thank you. Um, I do want to formally introduce him. James Laval is an internationally recognized clinical pharmacist, author, board certified clinical nutritionist, and expert and educator in integrative and precision health. James is best known for his expertise in personalized integrative therapies, uncovering the underlying metabolic issues that keep people from feeling healthy and vital. He's a thought leader in drug nutrient depletion issues, has published four books and three databases in his area alone. And he has over 35 years of experience integrating natural and integrative therapies into various medical and business models. Um, latest research, drug-induced microbiome disruption. We'll have to touch on that. There are so many areas we could go to, but today <laughs> we have our title is like, how do we revamp? How do we reinvent the metabolism, especially with nutrients and peptides? And I know, um, Jim, a lot of like, like you probably, you see a lot of patients who are really stuck, whether it's toxins or infections causing weight gain or dysmorphic body images and things. So First of all, though, let's start on how did you get into this field? Where was your start? Where was your start? How did you get excited about integrative functional medicine? Tell us your story. Well, you know, it was interesting. I was always in the training. Uh, so at age 13, I made my parents take my weight bench and my barbells you know, on vacation. And I, you know, I refused to go on vacation without it. So I was a big, big, you know, big advocate of training. I was a scholarship athlete. And I, you know, I actually ended up um, qualifying for the uh, Mr. USA, you know, it was bodybuilding, wow. but I felt, I looked incredible. I felt horrible. Mm -hmm. And I had this rich history of antibiotic use. And I thought amoxicillin was a part of my food plan, like the bubblegum flavored stuff. Yeah. And then the Dimetap was part of the food plan. So when I got to age 21, I was, I was having rashes and wheels and all kinds of reactions going on, feeling tired training. And I was going to a you know, pharmacy school where we had a rich history in botanical medicine. So I, we, we actually got taught plant medicine, you know, in our pharmacy school training. So I ended up going to a doctor who put me on a rotation diet, cleaned up my gut, helped to work on restoring my diurnal pattern of my adrenals. This is in 1982. Wow, lucky and you, because so there weren't many around then, right? <laughs> all, I, this, this um, doc was amazing. Dr. Poland, God rest his soul. He was an amazing doctor. And so immediately, I got out of pharmacy school, and I was behind the counter, and I was working in a, you know, the, a, actually a clinical mm -hmm. uh, setting with the city. And I just, you know what? I got to do more than just talk about medicine to people because I felt the power of nutrition and how it changed my life. And I literally went from, you know, being in a pharmacy program uh, to walking into a doctor's office and saying, Hey, I want to do integrative care. And I, I want to start teaching people how to eat better and what nutrients to use. And, uh, and that's kind of how it got started. I just jumped right in because the water was really good and cold. And so since not basically 1985, I've been full-time, I uh, had a practice where we did three, three to 400 patients a week, uh, have done programs where we worked on a quarter of a million people through lifetime fitness. Wow. Uh, and so I'm a, obviously I'm a little enthusiastic about it now, turning 62 next week, uh, feeling pretty pumped about uh, still this area of integrative care, functional health, and really working with people you know, understanding their chemistry so they can feel the best they can feel, right? That's all we're hoping for, for people. Yeah. And I, like I said, I want to dive into nutrients and peptides and all that. I love your story though. And I remember just to be, be personal and we met through A4M probably, but all kinds of other lecture areas, but sure. you were a mainstay even before I came on the circuit. So I remember listening to your lectures, you know, at the, probably at the beginning when you started right. being there. So we're always great, yeah. and always, always, always enjoyed that. So it's, it's been a pleasure to learn from you as well. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So no, I mean, I think that when you think about it, most people that we're dealing with their metabolisms are stuck. I mean, you got 80% of the population's overweight, 50% of the population's diabetic. You've got all the folks that have the, you know, the SIRS complex from their biotoxin exposures. And, you know, it's this mix of inflammatory chemistry, hormonal shifts and failures due to stress, sleep, yeah. overtraining, whatever. 
And then hypometabolism. So one of the big areas I wrote, I actually wrote a book on it called Diabetes and Cancer, Epidemiologic Links and Molecular Evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great bedtime sleep. You have yeah. one page, you're out. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a textbook with Carger Press. And I felt so fortunate to get asked to write a chapter in it because I really learned about, you know, the big problem with people when they develop, you know, with, whether it's in SIRS or whether it's in people that are just flat out insulin resistance is when you become inefficient with the way your body generates energy, yeah. everything slows down. And now I can't burn fat. I don't have energy. You could tell me to eat a lower carb a diet, but as soon as I leave your office, even though I really liked you, I'm not stopping at the broccoli shop. Yeah. There, there, there's, there's donuts and nachos on the way home and pizza. And, and, when, I, and when my energy uh, ability to make energy is low, I'm going for the high carb energy, man. I got to have it because I feel so worn out and wrung out. So I think for us, it's exciting when we get people to gain their vitality back. And at the cellular level, the mitochondrial level, we restore that 38 packets of energy coming through oxfos versus that two packets of energy that occurs through glycolysis when you shut down the ability of your body to utilize sugar efficiently. So mm -hmm. anyway, I thought I'd introduce kind of hopefully well, how we can apply peptides and nutrients and that no, construct. Perfect, because I see so many people coming in and I obviously deal with a lot of mold and Sears illness. So that's one big component, this chemical toxicity that poisons the mitochondria and burning capacity causes that's left. Right. But let's talk through, so say we have an average could be male or female, but um, say for just for an example, we have a 45 year old female who comes in and says, I've just gained 20 pounds. I've not really done anything different. Um, what could be the problem? Take us through like the areas we might look at. Cause one of the things I hear all the time, and I'm sure you do too, it's probably my thyroid. Well, probably 90% of the time, sadly, we wish it's that easy, right? It's not the thyroid. That is one thing right. that affects us like the gas pedal on metabolism, but usually with the stuff we're talking about, that's not it. So what other things would you look at and let's talk through that kind of case of what you would, how you would start. Assessing. So let's build, let's build to the complexity of it, right? So the first step you look at, the very first step for me is what's your cortisol pattern like and what's your sleep pattern like? So that's one, because when we flatten our cortisol curve, when we lose the diurnal pattern of cortisol, meaning yeah. uh, for those out there listening, cortisol goes up, supposed to go down in the middle of the day, go down some more in the evening, and then go down at night. When we keep stuck in sympathetic overdrive or excess sympathetic tone, too many fight or flight chemicals, what starts to happen is, is that because with the event of cortisol, creates more inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6, for example. And IL-6 turns off your insulin receptor. Mm -hmm. So right away, your insulin receptors start to retract back into the cell membrane. And now you have to produce more insulin. And when I produce more insulin, lots of things start to happen. Mm -hmm. Chronic inflammatory chemistry starts to occur because more adrenaline pumps because of that insulin. I, I start to store fat beautifully, yes. right? I'm getting really efficient at, burn, at, at doing that. The other piece is, is that as your cortisol is starting to flatten out, now you've got that person, then you say, oh, sir, are you craving carbs much? And they just look at you and go, oh, I'm fine until four o'clock. Yeah. I get home and I look for the Lay's bag because I'm gonna hug that potato chip bag and tell them I love it. And that's because- when we, we right, it's because because we got forty percent of the population with 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 some sort of dopamine SNP issue, at least one allele for dopamine, and that means when I get under chronic stress, I'm going to need reward, and reward is not broccoli. Right. Reward is oh wait, I'm going to eat one chocolate chip cookie. No wait, I'm going to eat two. No wait a second, I don't like even numbers. I'm going to eat three. Yeah. Uh, and so we rationalize, we eat, and then we eat past being full, and we eat in order to placate that dopaminergic drive. So stress causes issues around insulin regulation, fat storage, obviously more push towards uh, sympathetic tone and your immune system getting activated. But then it also starts to trigger things like appetite. And then that also pushes into how we get a disturbed sleep pattern. And so when we have a disturbed sleep pattern, now that contributes to weight gain, obviously, because our, our brain doesn't get that that rejuvenation cycle that it needs in order to reset the diurnal pattern 
for how the beta cells of your islets of Langerhans release insulin for the next 24 hours. So a lot of people don't realize that when your melatonin cycle is off, that is actually what creates the next 24 hour beta cell action from your pancreas to regulate insulin, right? So right away, cortisol, sleep, insulin, mm -hmm. right? Very easy. Yeah. Now we can extend to that. What's your diet like, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so when somebody comes in, they say, I'm 20 pounds. I haven't changed my diet. Well, sure. Maybe you weren't eating right all along and now it's just caught up with you, right? So we have to talk about, well, what, what, how are you eating? And, you know, I'm not, look, I've, you know, I obviously I'm on the advisory board for folks that, that, you know, with Prolon, I get the fasting mimic diet stuff. I'm into time restricted eating. I understand all that. But in the end, I think mean, we both know, I don't think there's any one diet that works for everyone. I think there's people should eat more plant food. Yeah. And then as long as they're not sensitive to it, as long as their gut's not broken down or not having allergies to it. So, so if I have to think through the next step of why I gained weight, well, maybe your so, gut's broken down. And Jim, I want to say something really quick here and come back to the gut, but this is relevant. Like you said, the, first of all, then there's no diet that fits once, once I fits all. So anyone out there who's saying this diet is going to work for everyone, don't listen because it's not true. You and I personalized diet. That's so key because each person is different. Number two, I love fasting in the right person, but I have seen, like you said, I want to actually make uh, clear here. Patients who have, you know, flatline cortisol or women who are in the changes of either uh, post-pregnancy or menopause, some of these categories, and I see women more than men, they don't do well with fasting. They maybe already have disrupted um, or they already have low hypoglycemic tendency. So I love that you said that because I'm a huge fan of that for the right category. And I think men in general do the physiology better than women, but I've been speaking out more and more because I hear a lot of, you know, books out there and new things out there about everybody should be fasting. Everybody should be intermittent fasting and not everybody should be right. Cause if you have a flat line, like almost Addisonian person, they are not going to do well on a fasting mimicking diet. Well, I always have said, so time restricted eating, I think is funny. Because yeah. when I was a kid, I came up in an ethnic family, right? Very Italian. Yeah. And, you know, Jimmy, we have breakfast at seven. We got lunch at noon. You have <laughs> dinner by 530. And if you're a good little Italian boy, you get a cookie at seven. Uh -huh. It's a 12-12 setup. That's yeah. the way we used to eat. And now right. we're making a big deal out of, yes, we've known. The Chinese knew this, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at Shen cycles yeah. in Chinese medicine, it was clear that night was when your body repaired and you weren't mm -hmm. to feed because yeah. the energy to utilize that food could not be utilized for repair cycles. Yeah. And now we're finding out that that was completely true. The Chinese yeah. figured it out in TCM. Right. So it's so right on. And, and I, I also think one of the big things I try to work with people is try to get them to understand that it's not normal to have to be on I'm on a modified ketogenic vegan FODMAP diet and I use yeah. gaps on top. Uh, so basically I can have water and occasionally a twig. We're, we, we don't I want love that because our next topic is the gut. And you and I know <laughs> exactly. the FODMAP diet is starving the microbiome for a purpose for a limited time. But you stand a FODMAP diet forever. You starve your diversity in your microbiome, which is again, where you were headed before I interrupted you. <laughs> so no, but, that's it. And I, and I'm really big about trying to get people to understand we need to get you back to as much diversity as possible. And yes, look, I'm somebody that can't tolerate cow's dairy. I mean, that's what got me sick my whole childhood. Why I had ear infections, why I had sinus problems. Well, my whole childhood, I got a milkshake every night from my dad who worked a 12 hour day to oh, bring me a milkshake to show me he loved me. And I was sick you're like, virtually all year know. round. Oh yeah, one big snot nose. Yeah. They call me snot boy, right? Oh my goodness. So, so you know, I think it's important for us to, to help people understand our goal is to get you back to normalcy and the gut is important because look there's a lot of ways that your gut can get permeable a lot of drug therapies 24 percent of the drugs on the market are thought to disrupt the microbiome that's our latest database that we're researching we did all wow, the research on drug and that's huge that's, that's crazy awesome. and look it's not just the antibiotics right it's not just the oral contraceptives Right. It's not just the PPIs, it's statins, mm -hmm. it's metformin. Mm -hmm. So everybody thinks, oh, metformin, the greatest anti-aging drug, right? And I'm not saying it's not a fantastic drug and there's some value when you look at longevity medicine, 
But once again, when we look at people as individuals, we have to understand, well, is it going to be right for me? What's it doing to my gut microbiome? Am I getting a loose stool from it? What's my methyl malonic acid look like when I'm met, metformin for a year? You know, I'm, and a lot of times we don't do that. We just hear the highlights and then we start using it and we should be digging yeah. deeper yeah. to just understand where, you know, where am I, I going? Close, close uh, experience with that. And 20 years ago when I had breast cancer, I had three drug chemotherapy. Yeah which no surprise that chemo drugs could induce impermeability, but cytoxin, one of the drugs that I took absolutely in the research, it shows maybe it's anti-cancer effect is by increasing permeability is stimulating immune function. Right? So I had that drug and I chose to, and that was the right thing for me for the cancer. But within six months after I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And again, we don't have to go into my story, but it's so relevant because I basically induced permeability to a higher degree. I didn't know I had celiac. I was eating a gluten-full diet. I had NOD2, which is a high risk for Crohn's. So I had the perfect right. storm for permeability to create another autoimmune disease. And again, just relevant to what you're saying, because a lot of drugs we don't think about, like I wouldn't have thought about that as a creating a more permeable gut, but it did. And it's very, very real. Many, many drugs do that. Well. And there's a lot of people on PPIs. There's a lot of people on statins, antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there, there, it's, it's a, I actually have a, I, I just wrote a little ebook on that. I mean, I'll even share it with you. So, like, cause I got all the latest research yeah. on it. I'll be glad to send it to you. So the, so the other thing is, is that you can get it from a TBI. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. find out that you hit your head and within 10 minutes of a head strike, if you've had a TBI, your gut permeability changes yeah. significantly. And it, it, you know, people don't realize that yeah. the, these are the kind of things that are happening. That yes, the gut bone's connected to the brain bone. Yeah. And that I can, and, and it, it's also understanding that this is a really important thing. A lot of times people go, oh, when in doubt, begin with the gut. And I'm, I'm kind of good with that. That's what happened with me. It's how I got into this. But I also know that you can work on your gut forever. And if you're anxious, Yep. or you're depressed, or you perseverate, or you've got a lot of excess stress on you, and you're not doing things to countermeasure that, mm -hmm. you're going to stay with a leaky gut, and you're just going to develop new food allergens as you rotate the old ones out, and you never get to the well, bottom of it. You if you don't again, just to reiterate for people listening out there, often a doc puts you on an elimination diet. You take out corn, soy, gluten, dairy, egg, sugar, alcohol, right? Like that's so common. Not a bad yeah. idea because what you're doing is you're taking the load off the immune system temporarily, giving your body time to rest and not be totally overstimulated so that you can heal that gut. But what you and I are both saying is you don't want to be on a completely restricted diet forever because you're going to starve some of those good microbiome components and, and all these other things meds, chemicals. So how does the gut and weight and met metabolic function connect? I mean, you and I know the LPS story. Do you want to go into a little bit about how can people oh, have sure. <laughs> tough guts and have weight gain? Like how does that connect? So it, so it ends up that when you're, when, so when your gut is starting to get starved one, and when you're reducing blood flow too, and you're killing off good bacteria, the gram negative bacteria in particular, what, what starts to happen is, is that you circulate endotoxin, circulating endotoxin. And it here is circulating endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide actually attaches to all of your organs and triggers NF kappa B. So it triggers cellular inflammatory signaling. So even for autoimmune thyroid, they're now showing that the lipopolysaccharide receptors on your thyroid is actually probably what's starting the triggering of autoimmune thyroid. So the gut gets leaky. Now your liver and your lymph are supposed to get rid of that lipopolysaccharide. The liver gets congested. It can't. The lymph is already overloaded with too many, you know, debris as byproducts of metabolism. And now the LPS goes around and it crosses the blood brain barrier. And so what they find is that you get microglial activation, neuroinflammatory response, and then a change in your allostasis of how your hypothalamus and pituitary are signaling all the aspects of your metabolism, like adrenal, thyroid, and pancreas relationships. And that's kind of how the gut starts to really kind of weave its way. It's almost a metastatic, it's a metastatic model for obesity, if you want to think of it that yeah. way. Yeah. Right. We were really because it's, like, the chemicals are coming from the gut. Right. And they're exactly. going everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and so that that's how it's a big issue. So when that woman is 45, it's OK. We've got gut, cortisol, sleep, blood sugar, stress. 
Mm-hmm. And then we think about, well, what drug history have you been on? Have you been on oral contraceptives? You know, what's your estrone like? You know, how are, how are, what type of estrogens are you making? You know, you know are, are there any other drug therapies that may have, you know, have lowered or reduced the nutrients you need, say, for example, for your thyroid to function? And it's not just, do I have tyrosine and do I have iodine? Do you have enough chromium? Do you have enough ferritin? Because you need ferritin to make your thyroid hormone bind to the cell and cause that action of oxidative phosphorylation and burn fat. So it, it, you know, it's always amazing for me because I think it's incredibly easy. My brother was 476 pounds. Wow. My, my mother was obese. My father was a type two diabetic. It was obese. So everybody looks at me and goes, Hey, wow. You know, you're, you look, you know, I'm the weight I was in high school. You know, I train a lot. I'm into it, you know, but if I didn't do that, if all I did was go out and yeah. ate what I wanted, I'd, I'd be kind of big. Uh, yeah. So, so I think it's important for people to realize, I think it's easier and easier because of the, what you said to start our, our discussion, environmental burden, look at pesticides, yeah. right? Pesticides that's disrupt the elephant the in the room, stuff. isn't it, Jim? Like that's the thing that I know you see this as well, but that's the thing that's exponentially increasing. And I really think even why we fared so poorly in the pandemic was because our toxic load is so weighting our immune system, weighting our metabolic system. Um, let's just talk just a brief bit about that. If you are overweight or trying to lose weight, how do you deal with the toxic burden in that? Because that's a big piece of the puzzle, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. So I think, you know, first of all, doing things like infrared sauna uh, can be helpful. Regular exercise, even walking yes. can be helpful. I mean, those are, that's great. Um, and you know what, for some people, if they're not, if they don't have the money or they're not going to someone, look, to start out by cutting gluten and dairy out and count your carbs that you're currently eating and just try to cut it in half and see if you notice a change in your metabolism. Uh, and, and that can be beneficial. Now I understand that some people are hypoglycemic. So you, you always have to say, well, how do I feel when I cut down some carbs? Am I getting dizzy? Am I getting lightheaded? You know, what's going on? Well, in that case, then I start to think about where your insulin receptors might not be working well. And the number one nutrient associated with the development of insulin resistance is magnesium. And so a couple of the things I like to get on the nutrient side is get magnesium on board, get chromium on board, get B vitamins on board, because those are all nutrients that can help you to make that insulin receptor work better, just like alpha lipoic acid can as well. Now, if you want to get into the world of peptides, there's a couple of very cool peptides, yeah, right? Transition um, peptides. I love talking. About <laughs> You're going to have me running around the world here. Love it. So, we're, so, 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 you know, so I think on the peptide side, uh, mot C, so mm-hmm. mot SC is a mitochondrial peptide that helps with creating more mitochondria within your cell, which is what disappears. So when your thyroid hormone goes down and your insulin receptors are less efficient, you lose 40% of wow. your mitochondrial capacity within your cell. Wow. 40% of your mitochondria go away. So that means you don't have any powerhouses, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the first thing. So mot C what it does is it helps to, to, to kind of boost and trigger getting those mitochondria back in the cell, driving energy production. And then more importantly, it helps the insulin receptors to also start to open back up. Because of course, mm-hmm. when the mitochondria work, yeah. your cells start to work. Now, real popular for people using things like semiglutide nowadays. Yep. So semiglutide or the trade name Ozembic, but compounding pharmacies are using semiglutide, a GLP-1 agonist, which is going to help you with that, you know, glucose disposal and utilization. The trick on that one is I like using ipramorelin and CJC-1295, which is a basically a growth hormone secreted dog, Mm -hmm. because it also that ghrelin stimulus helps you to keep from getting nauseous from Uh, the semiglutide. And I have, like you, what I found is that the leptin resistance with sears and mold is so tricky. I think it's one of the hardest ones to overcome. And that GPL1 agonist is very effective for leptin resistance. So it's off label. Yes. It's not going to be, so just know your insurance is not going to cover this. It's off label usage. However, it works. <laughs> exactly. Well, and if you get it from compounders, mm-hmm. it's about a quarter of the cost yeah. of, of, you know, getting the trade name. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so, and then using that, the ipramorelin, why do I think that's important? Well, you know, a lot of people, when you're, as your free cortisol goes up, you inhibit gonadotropin releasing hormone and growth hormone releasing hormone. Uh -huh. So ipramorelin and CJC help when you've had people that have flattened their cortisol curve, they've, they're hypervigilant, they're not releasing growth hormone like they should. And I'm not a big fan of elevated IGF ones. I'm a fan of effective IGF one. I couldn't agree more. 160. Yeah. I, yeah. I never, 120 I, to 160. I, I yeah, and I almost never prescribe growth hormone by itself because I feel like it's too suppressive on the axis. Like I feel like you can get a better job with peptides without suppressing the natural production. That's exactly right. And and you re-kickstart it in people that have suppressed it due to their stress response, yeah. their allostatic load, right? And then on the other side, for gonadotropin releasing hormone, uh, kispeptin. Now, of course, you could use HCG, but kispeptin is an interesting peptide. Actually, in fertility, I mean, I've had a few women here recently where, you know, we've used kispeptin that have had a very difficult time getting pregnant. And within three to four cycles, yes. they're pregnant, I agree. And which is very, very exciting, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, what, what I like about peptides is that I think for, for those of us that are really looking for another tool in our toolbox mm -hmm. that allows us to kind of reconnect those broken enzymatic communications that have stopped people from maintaining homeostasis, right? They're broken. Yes. So they never can quite get to homeostasis. They've always got a little bit of dysfunctional metabolism. They're making too many inflammatory compounds, misfolded proteins are starting to aggregate. All yes. this little stuff just keeps coming. I like peptides because we start to create this signaling ability um, to get people, to, you know, for their chemistry to remember, oh, this is how I was supposed to function. I love that because that's exactly, again, with the sears and the mold illness, it's real. First of all, I say we have to detox first because your body's doing what it's supposed to do and dilution is the solution to pollution. So you put on some weight so you protect that, that excess toxicity. So if you are out there and you're in mold, you usually have to detox first before you're going to lose weight. And it just is the way it is. I say about six months minimum. That's right. Would you agree there? And then start the weight loss after. I mean, not that they I, 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 weight, but it's hard. I totally to agree with you. I, no, I've seen so many people where until you get their inflammation signaling down, due to whether it's their sears or their or or whatever, toxic metals. I mean, I have people come yeah. to me after their breast cancer. I, I find yeah. platinum in them, right? They're storing platinum in their bone and you got to get it out, right? So I, you got to get that stuff out. And it's almost as if when they hit this waterfall of you've got enough of the inflammogens out of their body and all of a sudden, I lost weight this month. Yeah. It's yeah. been four months. It's been six months. I'm starting to feel it. I'm not feeling puffy anymore, yeah. right? They're not feeling all that histaminic fluid retention, right? That, and I, you know, I think for sure that that's a, a key thing. Mm. No, I totally agree. And I love that you say that because it's always hard to tell them because they come in, they want weight loss, right? And then we oh, find yeah. this cold illness or there's toxy metals or there's another infection. And I'm, I always hate saying, I'm so sorry, but it's going to be almost impossible. And it's actually not in your best interest to start weight loss before you detox. Because what happens is this might be some experience for those of you listening. I'd love to ask your opinion, Jim, on this. When you lose weight loss, when you're very toxic, you can actually get much sicker because you have less dilutional effect. And so your chemical load is actually higher per square inch of your body. Um, and people can get really sick and then they often either gain the weight back or they say, I felt terrible. What's your thoughts on that if we lose weight too soon in the process when they're toxic? Well, I, I mean, I think there's several layers to that. I think, first of all, you're exactly right. Um, and remember, the heavier you are, the more toxins that are stored in your fat cells. And so as you're dropping that fat fast, you're pushing those toxins into your circulation. And then, it, for example, if your urine's acidic, if you're acidotic, you're, you're not going to get rid of that through your kidneys. You're going to actually damage your kidneys because you're going to increase the oxidative burden on those, on those cells in the kidneys. And so I, I think there's several layers to that that you have to unpack for people because absolutely they have to realize, um, for me, I always tell people, I wanna lose weight slow and I wanna do it so that we're restoring your health. Because most weight loss programs, 30% of their weight loss is actually lean mass. Yes. And muscle is the metabolism of age. It's our, it, it's our, it is our currency of metabolism. If we're going to age gracefully, we need to retain our lean mass. And when you don't lose weight correctly and you create a loss of lean mass, you're going against 
everything that is going to promote your longevity and your repair if you're going through, you know, I've, you've been obese. I, mean, I took my brother from 467 to 285. Wow. So we got wow. 200 pounds off of him. Took us about two and a half years, you know, but it, you know, in the end, it really, it served him well. And so, uh, you know, amazing. I think, I think all your points are really, you know, you're, they're, you're exactly on spot. Yeah. What else would you do? So say someone comes in and their primary goal is weight loss, but we, we may see toxin, we may see gut issues, whatever else. What would you do with the workup as far as suggestion for testing? Would you do stool? Would you do organic acids? Would you do, what would you do for um, kind of a basic for weight loss as a primary complaint, but you're wanting to check nutrients and these other everything. Things? Yeah, me too. <laughs> sure. So, I mean, I always like, look, whenever I can get a digestive stool, I like it. If they have any kind of complaint, GI tract at all of, any, of anything, if they're pretty resilient and they're saying, hey, my bowel movements are good. I get absolutely no bloating, no gas. They stick their tongue out. It's not geographic. It's not coated. I, you know, I, you know I, I look here. Okay, they're not pale. They're not malabsorbent. All right, maybe I don't do the a stool test right away. But I definitely start with, you know, I get you know, all, all the standard things you would do. So, you know, homocysteines and CRPs. I like getting things like MMP9. Yeah. I even like at times being able to get stuff like collectin-3 in older men because collectin-3 is showing kind of a systemic inflammatory response. It can be, you know, creating a lot of fibrosis, yeah. right? Um, and then in addition to that, um, you know, obviously glucose and insulin. And I, you know, I, I have to get, you know, everything that's related to that. I, I like to look at uh, red blood cell magnesium, mm -hmm. red blood cell zinc. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I'll look at CoQ10 if they're on if they're on meds that are depleting CoQ10 or if they're over the age of 45. I look at CoQ10 because if you're low in CoQ10, it's hard getting the mitochondria functioning. Yeah. Obviously, folate and and and, and uh, B12. Uh, and and then if and then I love getting a a, a, a a salivary or urinary cortisol as well. Then of course, all other hormones mm -hmm. uh, and including, uh, you know, for men, estradiol and estrone and yes, DHT and yes, testosterone and yes, sex hormone binding glycogen. Uh, and then I like advanced, I actually like advanced lipid markers. And the reason I like advanced lipid markers is I can see how much metaflammation is taking place, right? So the term metaflammation is dyslipidemia, loss of muscle mass. I like to look at ferritin and iron because you see where people have adequate iron, but they don't store their ferritin. Yeah. That's because of inflammatory signaling down-regulating ferroportin. And so you'll see that a lot with people where they're, wait a second, your iron's really good, but you've got no ferritin. Yeah. That tells you they have metabolic inflammation underlying. Yeah. And, and so I'm looking for those kind of traits, even looking at a mean platelet volume, mean platelet volume, it's on every lab test you get. Nobody looks at it when it's elevated. That is a marker for metabolic inflammation. So I'm looking for all those kind of things in my initial workup. And then I start to refine the process of what did you, you know, you know, yeah. have you been in, in any kind of water damaged buildings? Yeah. Do, you know, what do you, you know, is, is there a, is there a serious component? Mm -hmm. uh, what do I think of toxic metal possibilities? Yeah. Um, typically, um, if I'm looking at organic acids, I'm actually more interested in like what's going on in the two, three IDO pathway and managing the mood of that person that's obese. Because the one thing I've learned, and I mean, we did it. We did a, a weight loss programs for a quarter of a million lives with lifetime fitness wow. because they weren't getting people to lose weight. Yeah. And one of the biggest reasons people can't lose weight uh, and I also interviewed a, a huge clinic, million patient chart lives, and they always wanted to come back and get their bifetamine. Why? Because their focus wasn't good when they didn't take the bifetamine, so low dopamine, and their cravings were out of control. So I always like looking at that two, three ideal pathway and finding out, hey, where's your kenurinic acid? Where's your, where, where's your quinolinic acid? And then more importantly, if they do have candida, I know because of their aldehyde oxidase, their holding histamine and they're also making more phenols in their brain so the aldehyde oxidase ends up creating problems they make beta carbolin and salsolinol in their brain instead of dopamine and serotonin so i'm big on getting that brain right so yeah. that they're clear-headed and not craving yes oh i love that because that's really that one of the course too it's this behavioral piece but it's often um, granted, I mean, we do have free will and choice, but there's so many times when that me um, messed up metabolism, messed up neurotransmitters drive, and they really are kind of a victim to their neurotransmitters. 
So I love that you say that because some people, they can really be trying hard and they have no dopamine or they have no serotonin and it's going to really mess with what they're eating, right? I love that. That's love exactly that. right. I mean, I, for the biggest time for me, people, you know, I would hear it over and over again. I would have, especially women, because in my clinic in Ohio, we had a, you know, we had a women's health center. So we did preconception care, um, bioidentical hormones. I mean, my thought, my OBGYN there was, you know, wrote the idiot's guide to menopause, you know, so we had a lot of women going through and the, the self-esteem issues around, oh, I, I just can't control that craving pattern. I'm bad. Right, I just right. don't want it bad enough. And it really wasn't that. It right. was, no, your, your chemistry's off and your brain is telling you to eat that in order to try to survive, but we need to change those signals. And I think it's really important for people to understand that most of the time, for me, if, if it's, okay, I've got an overload of toxins, it's pesticides, it's metals, it's biotoxins. Okay, that's one category. Two, it's stress. Three, it's diet. For its drug history. Yeah. And, and a lot of times now it's people that are overtraining. I've got people that are overtraining and can't lose weight. So, you know, that that's another area. That didn't used to be the case 20 years ago when I was doing this. Nobody was overtraining, right? I mean, everybody right. was kind of on the table. But now we got, I'm doing the Spartan. Yeah. I'm doing the Ragnar. I'm doing the Ragnar Spartan combined. You know, I got all these people that are training like professional athletes. And well, I love uh, when you say that because I always share just a little of my one of my stories is, is that um, probably about four or five years ago, I had been doing high intensity interval running like very high intensity sports. And that was my whole life because I was like a dopamine cortisol driven kind of person. But then when I hit really? about 40, yeah, surprise, surprise. Right? <laughs> um, then I hit about 40. I and I, yeah. And, and I had the mold and I was inflamed and like things weren't working. I was losing muscle, gaining fat, gaining inflammation. And literally, one of my really smart trainers told me, take 30 days off. I don't want to do any, but walk. I was like, no way. You know, cause again, I'm dope, but I'll tell you what, Jim, in that like next six months, I lost 8% body fat and I became the healthiest shape I've ever been in by basically stopping my workout regimen. Now I do weight training. I do walking. I do hiking. I don't sure. work out like I used to anymore. Not at all. Because when that shift in my hormones and cortisol and everything happened, it, it made me realize it's not, again, we think that we have to go do, and I was doing six, seven days a week. So completely overtraining for me at that stage in life. And I saw uh, none of this was taught in medical school, <laughs> right? Like I, I thought I should have had a knowledge about that. And yet I had no idea uh, because I didn't think, you know, you know, anywhere from 20 minutes of high intensity interval to an hour run was overtraining. But for me at that age and my life, it was overtraining. So I love that you said that because I learned very Absolutely. clearly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I work with, cortisol, I've got right? athletes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've got athletes in all five major league sports. I've worked with spec ops. I mean, I, I'm, I'm around a fair amount of, that's, yeah. that's half of my life. And then the other half is just dealing with everyday folks and their problems. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize the difference between a professional athlete and someone who isn't, it's their nervous system. It's not how much muscle they have on them. It's how resilient their nervous system is to the stress. And if they yeah. can reset it, and for most of us, when we push ourselves that hard, just like what you said, your cortisol goes up under out of control. You start to lose lean mass. You start to sore fat. And I'm I tr I'm a big fan of trying to get people to just look, just start moving, be yeah. moderate. And that comes from somebody. I'm like you. I'm a recovering exerholic. I mean, I love to hit it hard. Yeah. I mean, you know. Right. And now I'm, you know, just keeping yeah. it to where I can be healthy as I'm aging. Right? I got to get to seventy. You know, I'm eight years I'll away. Do, so you know. Great. <laughs> I love that though. Cause it does change in our age categories too. Like twenties and thirties, that was perfect for me. But then when I hit 40, it was, I really needed a change. And like you said, I love that you mentioned that. Cause at that time in life, I was recovering from mold illness. I was running a full-time clinic. So because all the other massive stresses in my life were raising cortisol, I didn't need exercise to do the same thing. Like I needed exercise, yeah. something to like, <laughs> right. So it was a learning for me that I'm, and now I'm really understanding like, wow, not everybody should be out there running you know, 10 miles a day. <laughs> so That's right. Well, it's all about balance, right? In the end, it's about how do I, how do I create this chemistry that says adequate rest? And I love that people are using whoops. I mean, Hey, aren't you happy that now we know what time it is to breathe? Exactly. <laughs> Right. I, I, I could, I, I, I didn't, re I didn't realize I it. my aura ring, right? Like the moment I wake up, I want to, how did I sleep? Duh. I slept great, but like, I have to know the data. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was cool about it, honestly, I mean, I, I think it's unfortunate that honestly people don't breathe. I mean, I, I, that they're stuck in sympathetic you know, tone, 
But I love it when people do their aura or whoops now or or any any wearable device because they're going, oh, I drank two cocktails. Yes. I, I didn't have a good night's sleep or, oh, I ate that piece of pie or, oh, I had that gluten. And wow, look at the way it affected me. So I love that for weight management as well, because it gets people aware of what's keeping them in tune with themselves exactly. and, and what's back. getting them out of tune, yeah. right? I think all those things are important when you're trying to get people to lose weight, when you're, even when you're using a peptide, if you're using a peptide at bedtime and you notice your, your, your REM and your deep sleep are off, well, maybe you need to change that, that, that dosing time up, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it, it really is, I think, an interesting, effective tool that will, you know, will continue to evolve our ability to apply it. But it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. It is. I love that. I just told a family member who's kind of pre-diabetic to get a continuous glucose monitor and it changed his life as far as seeing, oh, when I eat this, it, it does this or when I have an extra drink or, you know, so it was really helpful. Um, well, Jim, we have covered a lot. <laughs> no surprise. I knew we would. What's um, what's any last bit of wisdom you would give to someone who's like stuck? I mean, obviously they need to find a good integrative functional, someone who can really test and treat, but say they're on their own. Is there like a first step? You kind of talked about maybe sleep or what would be your first kind of bit of advice for someone who's stuck out? My, there? My, 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 my first bit of advice would be, um, first of all, don't give up and feel you're stuck. Yeah. Uh, search for answers that can change your life. And those can come at the most crazy places if you open yourself up to it. Because obviously I could say, hey, you know, get on a treadmill, walk 21 minutes a day, get better sleep, all that. But I think it's so important for people to understand. And, and this is something I say to my, my clients and my patients all the time. Your health is, you're, you're the one that's empowered to change it, first of all. But most importantly, it's going to be work. It's work but it's worth it because every little bit that you regain makes you appreciate what it's like to feel better rather than feel worse. And, and I think it's so important for people, um, even when you're feeling it, I know there's serious patients that, you know, man, they're having seizures and they're having electrical shocks and they're anxious and they've gained weight and they can't go into a building. I get it because I have those kind of folks too. So it's just important though that we give them hope and that we give them something to anchor onto. And if you're the that person, I went through that when I was, you know, passing out after I ate and I'd have, you know, wheels the size of a football on my leg. Uh, look for those answers and don't give up. That's oh, probably my number one step for people. I love that. And I love that one thing I think we can both say, um, we're in, I feel like I'm in my forties and I am in my best health that I've ever been in and better than twenties and thirties. And I feel like you could probably say the same thing where you're at. So there's hope even as we age, um, that we can be in better and better health, not declining. Well, aging is a disease in my opinion. Yep. <laughs> So, <laughs> let's fight um, back <laughs> yeah exactly thank you exactly. so much for your time i know you're so busy and we're honored to have you here thank you again so much thank you joe it was a pleasure it really was